you're a highly cooperative species. And if you're going to be a cooperative species, you can't just be beating each other up and threatening each other all the time. When we are thinking about comparing human behaviour to what we see in other species, where we find the most profound similarities is not actually in our closest living relatives. The most dreadful human beings have ever walked the earth. Time and time again, you see that they are absolutely convinced they are the virtuous kind of heroes. I've always been interested in what makes people tick and also what makes them do crazy and irrational things. I'm Will Storr. I'm an author and journalist. My name is Nicola Rehani. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I've studied pied babbler birds in the Kalahari Desert and tropical cleaner fish living on coral reefs to find out what we humans have in common with other species. Even though we come from different disciplines, both Nicola and I explore the hidden structures that define human behavior. And ask some unsettling questions about what drives us to act the way we do. Like, have we become a species driven by self-obsession and the desire for status? Are we really born selfish? Is cooperation a uniquely human instinct? Is it true that status is a fundamental human need and that our desire for it could explain much of the world's irrationality and conflict? Can we, as human beings, harness our species' superpower to cooperate and prioritise the we over the me. Join us to find out in Studio B Unscripted. So Nicola, you are an evolutionary biologist. You write really well in your book about how cooperative the kind of human species is. Are there any other kind of species that share our propensity for incredible cooperation? Yes, and in fact, cooperation is ubiquitous on the planet. We see lots and lots of species that behave socially like we do. Um, I think it's often quite tempting, in fact, when we are thinking about comparing human behaviour to what we see in other species, to instinctively always think about our closest living relatives on the planet, like chimpanzees and bonobos and the other great apes. But in fact, one of the sort of biggest revelations is that often where we find the most profound similarities between our own species and non-human species on the planet is not actually in our closest living relatives, but it's in much more distant connections. Things like, for example, um, meerkats um, that live in very tight-knit family groups in the Kalahari Desert, species like cleaner fish that lives on coral reefs um, throughout the Indo-Pacific. We know that that species routinely interacts with strangers mm. and that cooperation in that system is maintained by very similar systems to those that we use. So things like punishment for failure to cooperate and a rudimentary concern for reputation. So that's amazing. So, so, so there are ways in which the cleaner fish are more like us than the chimpanzee or the manobo, which we're much more used to thinking of ourselves as being like. Yeah, I think so. What we do often find is that it's species that are solving the same kinds of problems as us mm. and not necessarily those that are cl more closely related to us that we have actually quite a bit in common with. So I think today we're going to be talking quite a bit about status <laughs> and your book, The Status Game, um, talks about three different kinds of status that, um, that exist in our own species. What are the three kinds of status that we all play for in the status game? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you know, obviously you've written about this in, in The Social Instinct um, beautifully, like dominance is, is, is a big way of um, um, competing for status that's kind of ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. Not just violence, but the threat of violence, the, the threat of punishment. So we're kind of demanding and, mm -hmm. and grabbing status from other people, insisting that we're kind of attended to um, 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 uh, with a sense of status. But then in human groups, there's this kind of prestige form of status. We, we, we've developed these kind of non-violent ways of competing for status. Um, and that goes back to how 
you know, how, how we evolved, that we're a tribal species, they're a highly cooperative species. And if you're going to be a cooperative species, you can't just be beating each other up and threatening each other all the time. You've got to figure out other ways of working out who's on top, you know, who's on the bottom and, and, and you know, how we're going to cooperate in, in, in what way. And so, so prestige is basically um, proving, you know, demonstrating that you're useful to the group, you're useful to the tribe. Um, so the more useful to the tribe you are, the higher, generally speaking, you arise in, in, in the prestige forms of status. And there are two ways, um, again, generally speaking, of being useful to other people, your group. And the first way is virtue, you know, so, mm -hmm. so by being a, you know, a morally good person. And so that could be, um, uh, you know, being courageous in battle. Uh, that could be um, sticking to the rules and knowing the rules, but it's also enforcing the rules. I mean, you, you know, you, you write so so. What about punishment in in the social instinct? You know, and that's you know, punishing other people is is a way of um, expressing virtue and being useful to the group. Um, and then the other way is competence. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we're useful, um, you could be a um, you know a successful honey finder, a successful storyteller, a successful hunter, or a, you know a, a finder of tubers. So, so, th so those are the three ways that humans have evolved to kind of play for status, dominance, virtue, and success. And, you know, that, that was true of life tens of thousands of years ago. And you think about human life, you know, today, that's also true. That, that's kind of what we do. If you go on social media, you see that combination of dominance, people kind of threatening and bullying each other, and um, virtue, people kind of, you know, what we, what we call as virtue signaling, you know, um, broadcasting their moral beliefs, their moral, um, 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 you know, preoccupations, and also showing off their success on Instagram, mm -hmm. you know. You know, the holidays, the certificates, the... I'm right. so humbled by this. <laughs> and so <laughs> do you thing. find... Do you think that... Um, there's a sort of categorical difference in some respects between the kind of status that you can obtain through the dominance route, whereas the more prestige kinds of status is something which has to be bestowed upon you by other individuals. Definitely. So, yeah, dominance is you're taking status, you're, you're grabbing status from other people, and prestige, people are offering it to you. And as soon as you start insisting on, on, you know, that, that you should be treated as a statusful person, people don't like that. I mean, you know, part of all this stuff is about reputation. You know, prestige is all about... Um, um, trying to get a, a superior reputation. And I was wondering in your work if you'd sort of found that there is a particular kind of psychology of reputation. Maybe it'll be helpful to explain how a cleaner fish plays for reputation and just why that's so different to the way that we do it, for example. So the cleaner fish is a small fish about yay big that lives um, throughout the Indo-Pacific. They are pretty um, common and they hold small territories that we call cleaning stations where they're visited by all the other fish that live on the reef and we call the other fish their clients. <laughs> the clients visit to receive a service and the service is a cleaning service which involves the removal of ectoparasites and dead skin from, from the surface of the client's skin. The cleaner fish gets a meal in return but there's also a conflict that's bubbling away in this interaction which is that the cleaner fish prefers to eat the client's living tissues. And so now there's a problem because somehow these fish have to work out how to uh, maintain cooperation. How can the clients make the cleaner fish provide a good service without being able to, you know, write a contract, first of all, make sure you give me a good service. Um, there's no police fish swimming around to make <laughs> sure that, that the cleaner fish does what it's meant to do. Somehow they solve this problem. And one way that they do this is that clients actually have options about which cleaner fish they interact with. And while they're waiting to be serviced by a cleaner fish, they will watch what's happening in the current interaction. And if it doesn't look like it's going well, if the current client either jolts or if it flees away very quickly, then often the clients that are waiting to be serviced will also swim away and find a different cleaning station somewhere else. And what's even more astonishing in some respects about this underwater uh, system is that the cleaner fish actually provide a better service to their current client when they're being watched by a different one who might swim away if they don't behave nicely. And so. What we see here is something like a rudimentary concern for reputation. The cleaner fish is managing its image in front of these clients um, so as not to lose its next meal, essentially. And this sounds 
you know, on the face of it, it sounds quite similar to the kinds of things that we do. Like, we know that humans are super aware of when there's the possibility for our behaviour to be observed. We behave more cooperatively if, we, if we're being watched or if, if we know that our behaviour might be revealed to somebody in future. But the psychology that underpins the concern for reputation in the cleaner fish, say, versus a human is completely different. So for a cleaner fish, they can basically just learn through trial and error, essentially, that if I do this, if I bite this client, that one will swim away, therefore I won't repeat that behavior next time. So they learn, they learn that they shouldn't do something, but they really don't understand why at all. So, so they're not self-aware like we are. They're, they're, yeah. they're, it's all a behavioural thing where they're just working, if I do X, then Y will happen. So they just start doing X. Is that right? Yes, yeah. totally. So on the surface of it, they are managing their reputation. What we see is that, yeah, it, it's supported by very simple, what we call associative learning mechanisms. Whereas for humans, it, involve, it involves much more sophisticated cognition and being able to take another person's perspective and to understand how your behaviour might affect their impression of you. So this is the theory of mind that we sometimes read about, this idea um, in our head about um, how other people's minds work and, and, and we've got these kind of models of their kind of thinking and behaviour. Yes, totally. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that feeds into lots of aspects of our behaviour, like concern for reputation and wanting to signal things to other people, in particular on things like social media. I think you've called social media the slot machine for <laughs> status. Like, what can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the kind, of the, the kind of the fundamental kind of idea that was behind the status game book is, is this idea that we, we all desire... It's not, status isn't just, isn't just a desire, it's a need. You know, it's a fundamental need that, that, that we have. Um, just like, you know, we need to but feel like belonging in cooperation, but we also need to feel valued by, by our tribe. Especially when you think about it in the terms of those three games, the dominance, virtue and, uh, and, and success, um, that people are constantly manifesting those three behaviours on social media, and sometimes in, in combination. And, you know, it's, it's quite well known now that, you know, one of the things that, that, that can make social media feel really compulsive is that its um, rewards are inconsistent. So just like a slot mm -hmm. machine, you don't know what's going to happen next. And I think very often we're gambling with status. Like when we make a contribution to social media, whether it's a, a comment about a politician or a picture from our holiday or some, you know, pithy quote or whatever it is, it's our status that we're gambling with. And, and you know, the social media company has been very canny about... Um, adding to their platforms ways that we can specifically measure our status. It strikes me that often people do things on social media that don't turn out the way they might have hoped. And what do um, you think about yeah, that? Yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, yes and no. So there was a really interesting paper that I, that, that I wrote about um, in the status game where they talked about humble bragging. Mm -hmm. And um, th th this, this kind of thing that people always get wrong, and that is that, that when we're, you know, I've been doing it recently, actually, <laughs> we're putting pictures of our holidays and, you know, and th things that, are, um, that have happened that are good to us on social media. We expect that things that make us happy will make other people happy. But they don't, because status is often kind of relative. So, so, uh, you know, it's that whole, we hate it when our friends become successful. If, if a person you're, you feel is a bit like you goes up there, then that pushes you down there a little bit. So, so, so yeah, I, th I, th I think people are, are often quite bad at predicting, you know, the status bumps that they desire on social media. Mm. And do you think that with this idea of um, thinking of status as being a game of some sorts, is there any way in which sort of knowing that can that affect our behaviour in some ways or can that help us to be less obsessed by status? I think just being aware of the, the sub, kind of subconscious mechanisms behind lots of our behaviour is, is kind of really helpful. Um, you know, it can give us that kind of distance, especially when we are... Um, you know, we feel triggered by other people's kind of behaviour. We're not quite sure why. Often it's because we feel like they've kind of diminished us in some way. Sometimes we call it virtue signalling, mm -hmm. but you, you write about competitive altruism. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit about what competitive altruism is and, you know, how it manifests in human life. Sure. So competitive altruism is essentially the positional good. All that means is if I get more of it, you kind of have less of it. Yeah. Zero sum, essentially. Um, and we've actually explored whether people do use signals of generosity to compete for status using online fundraising pages. Now, the pages themselves are really good places to look for evidence of competitive signalling because 
when donors arrive at those pages, what they can see is all the previous donations that have been made. So we gathered a bunch of these pages from the 2014 London Marathon. And what we found is that actually men uh, and not women get into what we call these generosity tournaments, whereby if a guy comes onto one of these pages and leaves a large donation, and particularly on the page of an attractive female fundraiser, then, the, then it, there's, a, there's an increased um, probability of the next men arriving on that page giving a much larger donation as well. So we see that there's this potential for competitive signaling even in these rather sort of abstract online environments. But talk to me more about um, virtue signaling and about how, in some ways, that competitive tendency or this, this, this tendency to signal can sometimes also go wrong in a way. Yeah, so, so, so obviously this, you know, people compete, for, as you say, you know, for status, for reputation, and, and, and some of the domains they compete in is, is, is in these kind of virtuous domains. A lot of that is about what are the rules of my group? What are the rules of this tribe, this status game? And who is following those rules? Who's following them better than other people? And, and how can I enforce, show how virtuous I am by enforcing those rules? And we see these kind of you know, dynamics kind of spiral in, in terrible ways, you know, in the Soviet Union, in Nazi Germany, but also in, 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 you know, in less catastrophic, um, uh, to less catastrophic effect on social media. And I think the really dangerous thing about the virtue form of status is, that, is, is, is the easiest one to get. Like dominance can be quite hard. You know, you, you've got to have you know backbone and spine if you're prepared for a fight if you're going to compete with dominance. Competence can be really hard. You've got to mm -hmm. prove that you're more competent, more smart, more talented, more skillful than the people around you. That's probably the, you know that potentially the hardest one. But virtue is easy, especially on social media. It's easy to signal your virtue. It's easy to do to, to to say something cruel about this politician or that public figure or this person who you've never met before who has said something which is contrary to the rules of your group. Right. So, so, so yeah, I, I think that's where this competition for virtue-based status um, very frequently goes wrong in human groups. I guess it's sort of ironic in some ways that a tendency for virtue signaling could be something which actually ends up driving us apart or can lead, can fuel polarization. That's right, and I, and I think, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what's kind of counterintuitive to all this. You know, Hitler thought he was a good man. He thought he was saving the world. Lenin thought he was saving the world. He thought he was a good man. Time and time again, you see that they are absolutely convinced that they're, 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 they are the virtuous kind of heroes. Um, and, 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 you know, and that's, you know, as you well know, something that really separates us from many other, or, or, or essentially all the other kind of animal species. I think we also ought to ask our audience if they <laughs> have any questions for us. So maybe we could have some audience Q&A. Hi everyone. Um, hi Will. Hi Nicola. My name is Pandan. I'm from India. Oh, yeah. um, so cooperation on a grand scale has helped humans become the predominant species on the planet. Um, there's lots of examples of cooperation, you know, happening across borders. But media focus tends to be on instances of strife and discord. Would easy access to negative information threaten our future ability to cooperate for good? The thing that's springing to mind for me the most, in some ways, is. Um, the narrative that was really dominant around COVID and compliance and large-scale cooperation, um, which is basically people's willingness to do something that's really difficult for a profoundly social species like we are. A lot of the stories in the media have, and still are in some ways, focusing on isolated incidences of non-compliance. But I think it, mi it really missed the bigger story, in some ways the more surprising story about COVID, which was that actually compliance and, and large-scale cooperation was really, really high uh, for the majority of the time throughout the pandemic. And um, so I think in some senses, there can be a ways in which the media, by focusing on sort of isolated instances of non-compliance can send a message to people that non-compliance is much more common than it actually is and, and can therefore actually, ironically, undermine the cooperation that is going on. Sure, thank you. Thanks for the question. Hello, Will and Nicola. It's Orn here from the Book Talk Today podcast. Thank you so much for doing this talk. My question for you both is how does our ability to cooperate conflict with our desire for status? Thank you.
it's sometimes described as as this kind of twin desire humans have to get along and get ahead. But but you can't separate them out in that way because when you stop cooperating, your reputation goes down, your status mm -hmm. goes down. And and you know, the final chapter in my book was looking at communism, which was which was an attempt to form a society where it was all cooperation and no status pursuit and it, and it was an absolute catastrophe and and and, and there, there was status pursuit mm -hmm. i mean uh, uh, at one point sociologists found 12 distinct social classes in the soviet union in the 50s mm -hmm. so, so you can't separate um you know corporation and status but there's it's actually there's actually a more um a different point that your question brings up as well which is um something that people quite often mistake when we're talking about concern for status and cooperation, which is this idea that when people gain reputation benefits from cooperating, that the only reason they cooperate is because they have those reputation benefits in mind. And that's completely untrue. So lots of the time people are on a psychological level, quite unaware of the status benefits or the reputation benefits that their actions might bring. And they might cooperate for psychologically very pure reasons. Um, but that isn't to say that those, that those actions can't still yield reputation benefits. And that's why those things, in fact, are, have been selected for in an evolutionary sense. Hi, Will and Nicola. My name is Annette. I'm originally from Germany. Um, some people seem to see um, establishing dominance and achieving status um, as part as a reason for selfish and inconsiderate behaviour. Has that uh, sort of self-awareness changed due to being more visible and therefore more scrutinised online? As a species, the human um, tendency to resist big shot behaviour and to resist overt displays of dominance and to bring those individuals back in line is something that has been with us for much, much longer than um, social media. So that tendency to bring those individuals down a peg or two is something that's been really widely studied in lots and lots of um, pre-industrial and contemporary non-industrial societies. And in some respects, that is one of the key differences between humans and, say, a chimpanzee society, which is very despotic, actually. And human societies are much more egalitarian than those of our closest living relatives. And in part, it's because we do resist that kind of despotic, big shot, alpha male type behavior. Hi, I'm Paul Voss from the Netherlands. Uh, it seems that the more we understand like what drives us, uh, it also becomes more clear that we are kind of like at the whim or mercy of our biological and social forces that are not really in our control. Are we looking at like a dark future in which we understand our own undoing, but we have no means of doing anything about it? Or, you know, is there a spark of hope for a better future? I mean, I don't think there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's necessarily a dark future at all. I think, you know, I, I think the more we understand about human nature, the better. And, and the fact that we can start understanding about these kind of, you know, these subconscious kind of forces that, 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 that drive us. You know, when I went into the subject of status, I, I think like most people, I just thought it's a bad thing or people jostling for status. But what I realised, but it's that's not true, really. I mean, it's it's a bad thing, yes, but it's also an amazing thing. The fact that the fact that subconsciously we are often driven to improve our reputations. You know, we compete to be seen as altruistic. You know, when Nicola's talking about people competing to leave more and more money for these people, that's a really good thing. You know, in the book, I, you know, I write about, like, say, for the, the origin story of the iPhone, for example, which is when Steve Jobs was at a party and was irritated by somebody from Microsoft who was boasting about how they'd solved the future of computing. And that, and that, that, that personal irritation that he felt his status was diminished by somebody from Microsoft became the iPhone. I mean, you know, for good and for bad, of course. <laughs> but but that but that's the power of status to drive innovation. So so you know, with, without status, we wouldn't have civilization. We wouldn't have progress. We wouldn't have the moral sphere that we have, where people are you know very concerned with appearing virtuous and being virtuous. So 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 so, so and so. No, I don't think that. Absolutely, don't think that we are we are um, inevitably looking at a dark and horrible future. <laughs>Heretics, Will, you've talked a bit about people who, for example, become neo-Nazis or they join cults. What is it about these people that makes them 
start to believe crazy things. Well, I, I, I think the, sort of the broad answer to that is that the brain isn't particularly interested in the truth. It's not interested in accuracy in how the world works. The brain wants to know who do I have to be? What do I have to believe? Who do I have to become to cooperate with these people and to gain status you know, within them? In The Heretics, I write about the idea of the brain as the hero maker. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, if we've got a psychologically healthy brain, um, it's telling a story, you know, a story about, our, about how we're right about the things we believe. Um, so, 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 so and, and we tend to believe facts in inverted commas that flatter that kind of hero, hero making narrative. And, it, and any facts we come across in the world that contradict it, and the brain is very good at, right. you know, deflecting it and um, um, finding ways to kind of undermine it. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, they, they, I, I, and I think that's kind of, kind of kind of common in all of us, and and even really really smart people. I mean, you see, so in in, in the Heretics, I spent some time with David Irving, who was you know once seen as a you know a fantastic historian of the Second World War, um, and you know started to believe that Hitler was, in his words, a friend of the Jews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, 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 so you know, these these these, these kind of problems can impact the very smartest kind of people among us. But, you know, another side is that people do become kind of mentally unwell, paranoid. And I was wondering if you could speak to kind of how paranoia kind of impacts um, people and, and kind of it builds that kind of conspiratorial thinking. Yeah, so, well, paranoia is basically the belief that something bad will happen and that somebody else intends for it to happen. So we know that people who are more paranoid are more likely to endorse conspiracy theories, specifically ones that are about them, that pertain to something bad's going to happen to me, not just to society. Um, and it can be really pervasive. It's really quite common in the general population. It's not paranoia and conspiracy thinking are not just things that people who have a mental health um, disorder would would experience but in fact all of us can be paranoid mm. can't we you know paranoia is a normal part of a functioning human psychology like it's super interesting to me sort of in a way that when you're speaking to people who maybe have a slightly conspiratorial mindset do you find it difficult to gain access to your to people or to, to speak to them in, in ways where they will talk to you freely about their beliefs or is that well, you have to be a bit canny as a, as a, as a journalist, and certainly when I was um, reporting on with David Irving, uh, that, that was actually quite uncomfortable. So, 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 so David Irving was um, um, putting on these kind of trips to Holocaust sites in, in, in Eastern Europe. So I went along there and kind of had to basically pretend that I was a effectively a neo-Nazi. <laughs> so, so I was with all these people who were, you know, um, who were Holocaust deniers. We were in a concentration camp at one point and they were kind of questioning, why is that there, why is that there? And uh, it, 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 was, it, it was extremely uncomfortable. That's often the way in with people who have kind of very conspiratorially minded, that you have to kind of blend into them and kind of, you know, allow them to, you know, b believe that you kind of understand, you know, where they're coming from. F for me, anyway, I, I think that's a much better way of understanding them than the advers adversarial model where you're just attacking people and shouting at them because they, they, they kind of back away. Did you find in the end that you were starting to find points of common ground or did they still remain quite alien to you even at the... I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? They're, you're interacting with people on a personal yeah. level. No points of common ground, but, but certainly a lot more empathy. The thing that I thought was extraordinary uh, on that trip was the number of the men on that trip whose parents had fought or whose fathers had fought in the Second World War with the Nazis. And there was, on, on the final evening of the trip, there, there was a, a viewing of the film Downfall, uh, which is a hyper-realistic movie about the, the, the last days in Hitler's bunker at the end of the war. And there was a guy there who was Australian, German, who didn't want to watch the movie because his father was in the bunker with Hitler and he found it too upsetting to watch. And suddenly you understand that these are people who love their mums and dads, mm -hmm. and their mums and dads were Nazis. And so, 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 so the kind of their life's work almost has been to deny the story of reality, which is the Holocaust happened and the Nazis were, were awful. So that was a real light bulb moment for me. And, and, and if, does it, there were no points of common interest in, the, in, the, in that sense, yeah, but, no, but that certainly was a, a moment of kind of understanding, yeah, understanding like, a hum yeah. the, like seeing people as, as, as people and yeah. not just their beliefs. Yeah, and then I guess another question that I that I have about that is um, the extent to which those th those um, conspiratorial narratives or those tendencies to adopt those sort of radical world views are linked to status. How can we understand those in terms of 
losses and gains in status? Well, I mean, so, so, so the conception of the book is, is, is that groups are status games. In the status game, I write about the anti-vax movement, and I interviewed a former anti-vaxxer. In this, in this particular interviewee, she, 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 she came across a Facebook group and announced herself as a vaccine hesitant and was immediately surrounded by people saying, oh, well, mm -hmm. look at this and look at this and look at this. And she felt, she said she felt accepted. She, she was a young, um, soon-to-be mother, um, she was 18 years old, she admired strong-minded women, and here she was surrounded by these heroic-sounding strong-minded women, and she, she wanted to get their approval. So she started going out there and arguing with her cousin, arguing with her um, doctor, of course, not getting her child vaccinated. It took a, she didn't do that initially. So, so, so it's this active belief, and that helps you gain status. And the more you gain status, the more you want to go out there and, and, and mm. practice the belief. And I think that's, the, for me, that's, what, that's the really dangerous mechanism in a lot of these groups. Yeah, and I think there's even um, research showing that, for example, a conspiracy mindset or, or espousing conspiracy theories, for some people at least, is driven by a desire to be unique, a desire to show that you are an individual thinker, you do your own research and all that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, but equally, it's also about cooperation within the group. There's a very powerful effect that we, we, we tend to believe the things that the high status people in our groups believe. Is that part of, would you say that's part of a corporation mechanism or is that more about status? No, so part of how we think that culture spreads in humans is because people are more likely to copy high status individuals and, you know, thinking back to the, the, the paranoia and conspiracy thing, uh, topics, we know that um, if you feel low status, for example, or being either being low status in society or maybe being part of a marginalised ethnic minority group, or things like this can also be real triggers for people to experience more chronic levels of paranoid thoughts. But so when we think about how we see ourselves in some respects, and um, you've talked about in your book, for example, in Selfie, about the rise of individualism, and particularly yeah. in, in the West, and the narcissism that accompanies that. Where does that come from, and where is that taking us? Yeah, so, so, so there's lots of ideas about where, you know, why are Westerners, on average, more individualistic than, than, than people in other parts of the world? And, you know, there's a, there's a fascinating theory called the geography of thought. It's about how the physical landscape ends up impacting how we think and perceive the world. And so, 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 one, of the, so one of the ideas there are about why Western individualism seemed to begin in ancient Greece. And the theory is that the, 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 it was, the landscape was um, a, a place where group endeavours weren't really possible. Like if you go to China, you know, low hills, um, so uh, uh, I'm great for farming, uh, so, so, so big group cooperative farming endeavours. But in ancient Greece, that wasn't possible because it's mostly terrible for farming. The soil isn't good enough. And it was around, a, I think, a thousand individual city-states, um, um, cliffs descending to sea, rocky islands. So, so, so in order to get along and get ahead, it kind of had to be a bit more of a self-starter. You had to be somebody that was be a, a potter or a, mm -hmm. you know, tending a few olive, olive trees in your garden to make oil. Um, so, 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 so that creates this kind of individualistic um, ideal of self where in order to survive, to get along and get ahead, you had to kind of push yourself kind of forwards. And of course, very you know, fascinatingly, in ancient Greece, we see things like the narcissism myth. You know, um, Narcissus, who kind of fell in love with his um, um, image. You get you know great sporting competitions. You get the ideal of self-esteem. Uh, you get the ideal of you know, education. So so, 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 so yeah, you know, it, it's a kind of fascinating kind of theory. You know, it's not binary, but the Western emphasis on me, 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 me comes from the physical landscape of uh, uh, of ancient Greece. And I was wondering, sort of, whether you felt you know, kind of, kind, of, kind of this kind of individualism, kind of how that impacts our cooperation, our cooperative nature in the West. There's been a bunch of work done by people like Joe Henrik and, and people like that that have actually seen individualism through a different lens in some ways by looking at how um, you can understand individualism as being a reduction in the strength of family ties. So essentially, you're, 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 you're focusing less on your immediate family, immediate friends, and you're kind of broadening that social circle out and making your own links and your obligations are not actually so much within that tight, small circle, but you feel a much more impartial um, sense of obligation to pretty much everybody, right? So I think there's this 
um, idea that individualism in some ways can help us to explain the rise of large-scale cooperation, our willingness to cooperate with strangers that might also come, you know, with a, with a byproduct of being actually slightly less concerned with nepotism or helping our family, helping our friends and, and things like that. Do you relate to that sort of description? Yeah, I mean, I actually sort of write about that that, that idea in, in in the status game, the, the idea that actually, you know, Western individualism is about cooperating not with the immediate group, with the immediate family. It's kind of breaking those traditional ties and learning to cooperate with with with, with um, uh, people outside our group and seeing them not as members of groups as such, but as individuals. Mm -hmm. As you're useful to me because you're a potter and you're right, a, yeah, right. yeah, or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So selfie was was much more about how our kind of me focused Western self um, seems to have um, made us more perfectionistic. Right. And, and there was this sort of large study um, which looked at levels, rates of perfectionism in the West, in Canada, the US, and the UK since the 90s, and since. Um, you know, what's sometimes termed as, as neoliberalism, that kind of Thatcher-Reagan mm -hmm. revolution. The whole point of that was to increase competition wherever we could find it, to get rid of the big states, um, uh, to get rid of banking, you know, to, to regulation, um, um, get rid of um, um, you know, as many rules as possible, and to make everybody more competitive, and how the, the extraordinary kind of effect that had on the, the sense of the Western self. We went from screw the man in the 60s to greed is good in, in, mm -hmm. in just 20 years. It's quite extraordinary how we changed when, once the economy changed and how the rules of how we're supposed to get along and get ahead kind of had to change. But, the, you know, the de there were significant downsides to that, I think, and, and, and this rise in perfectionism is potentially particularly worrying because with perfectionism becomes, comes things like, you know, eating disorder, steroid abuse in men, self-harm, in, in, you know, suicidal thinking. Um, I, I was wondering if you, you felt that, you know, with all your kind of expertise and the amazing human art of cooperation, how we could harness our kind of genius for cooperation in the future to kind of make the world a bit happier, a bit more successful. You know, on the one hand, our ability to widen our social circles and to cooperate at more global scales with other people is really undoubtedly the reason that we managed to, you know, leave the environments in which humans evolved and to eventually colonize the globe. And so, you know, cooperating outside of our immediate family is a major part of our human success story. But it's also the reason that we are now massively overpopulating the globe and that, um, you know, we're overusing the Earth's natural resources. And so it's hard to say, actually, whether our tendency to scale up that cooperation and our cooperative ability is ultimately our, you know, is it our winning superpower or is it our undoing? I, I don't know, do, what do you think? I think what's often missed is that, that we are highly cooperative, but we tend to cooperate mostly within our own groups. And I think that's perhaps the hard, the hard problem to crack for humans because we, because we are ineffably groupish. It's very intuitive to us to cooperate at local scales. And, you know, you hear words like nepotism, corruption, bribery. We don't think of those necessarily as being cooperation, but those are all examples of cooperation that are hyper-local, but generate societal costs. And I think the big question for us is how we can cooperate to generate global benefits and not just global costs. And with that, I think we should uh, allow for some Q&A from the audience. My question is, is it worth spending time trying to make people convinced of conspiracy theories, especially with regards to vaccines, that they are not real? And if so, how do you go about countering those theories in our digital age? That, it's a really important question, actually. Essentially, what you're talking about is changing people's minds, and that's a really difficult thing to do, in particular when people ha have views that are quite entrenched and when repeating um, to them your own view can in some ways make their own view become more um, solidified. There is some work from behavioural economics that suggests that one effective way to change people's minds, for example, in the context of a conspiracy theory or, an, or something like that, is rather than attempting to um, lambast people with reasons why they're wrong, can be simply to ask them questions about why they believe the thing they do. And 
to some extent to undermine some people's confidence in, in the foundations upon which those beliefs can be built. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I think the, the other opportunity perhaps is that people are members of lots of different groups at once, lots of different status games at once. And I think one of the things we, we don't do enough of is looking at who has these beliefs and what else do they believe. If you're an American anti-vaxxer, there's a potentially high um, probability that you're a patriotic person, you love America. And so, you know, rather than trying to convince them that their, their specific beliefs about um, um, and uh, vaccines are wrong, you can tell a story potentially about how not taking the vaccine is an unpatriotic act because America's economy is being kept behind. You're letting America down by, uh, by, by, by refusing to be vaccinated. So that's just one example, I think, of, uh, of where we can actually exploit the fact that people have um, tend to not really realise it, but they, they often live um, by a number of contradicting kind of values, and we can use a, a kind of a separate value set to tell a story that might challenge their kind of embedded, unhelpful beliefs. Hi, Will and Nicola. I'm Andy Howard from the Six Farm Bolton. I'm just with a couple of the students that I work with. Uh, my question for you both is what place do conspiracy theories have in the classroom? As in, how should the teacher and the curriculum engage with conspiracy theories? What sort of lessons could be learned there? I mean, it's an increasingly important part of education, isn't it? I mean, one before the internet, conspiracy theorists were, tended to um, be exist in rather isolated sections of society and it's much more feasible now for people to connect with people who share a, consp a similar conspiracy mindset for them and for that to give the mindset credence so um i think understanding that that that, that this goes on and that people do hold the different worldviews and how they come to hold those worldviews is is a really important part of understanding how to navigate a you know the social media world what, what do you what do you think will i kind of very strongly believe that there should we should you know broadly teach um young people this is the human mind this is how it works and these are the things that it often gets wrong and you know conspiratorial belief for me is very much a, you know a, a, a predictable kind of facet of the storytelling brain and one one aspect of the storytelling brain is it, it's constantly making these cause and effect connections um uh, often where there shouldn't be cause and effect connections it, it's these causes and effects everywhere um, um when i was doing my research for the heretics one expert in psychosis gave an example of what happens when somebody becomes psychotic you know mentally ill and and they said you know like say you're walking down the the street and three red cars go past at once and they, they might think why has three cars just gone straight? I'm wearing, you know, red underpants today. Mm -hmm. How do they know I'm wearing red underpants? And so, so, so the, the storytelling brain is kind of going haywire and, and connecting dots that shouldn't be connected. And this is exactly what we see in conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 so I, you know, I, I think it's very important to teach young people some of this stuff and just to say, look, you know, your brain isn't this amazing reality um, reading machine. It's a storyteller. And sometimes those stories are going to be wrong. And here's how you can try and work out you know, w w whether the story that your brain is going a bit haywire. Hi, my name is Becky. I want to know uh, what you think about what cultures are good at co collaboration and how can we, in schools or in our normal lives, increase collaboration to teach us to be more collaborative with each other? So here's an example of two kind of contrasting cultures from the status perspective that I kind of write about in the status game. First one is the, is, is the company Enron, which is famously one of the most corrupt companies that ever existed. Um, so in Enron, they had, they, they had um, a culture, they had a, 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 a something called the Rankin-Yank system, whereby I think every year um, th they would sit in a room and go through all of the people who worked for that company and divide them in. So here's the top, I think it was 15%, here's the bottom 15% and here's the middle. Top 15% promoted, middle scared, bottom fired. And that is a terrible culture. You know, we all need status, we all need to feel um, um, valued. Um, and if, and if, we are, if we have a culture in which status is very hard to come by, we'll start jealous, A, start jealously defending it and start, um, um, you know, start being um, toxic and unpleasant to other people and defensive and so on. And B, as in the case of everyone, become corrupt because status is so hard to come by, we'll start cutting corners. The opposite of that um, is uh, like a global, keep fit, almost cult called CrossFit. 
I'm not a CrossFitter, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but, but CrossFit is famously two things. One is kind of culty. People who go into CrossFit love CrossFit. And two, it's incredibly successful. The difference between going to CrossFit and a traditional gym is it's a community. And in, in that community, status is freely given. Everyone's cheering you on. Everyone's congratulating you. There's no pressure for you to complete this one challenge that everyone's got to complete. It's up to you. It's, it's adapted to your kind of strength. So the best culture is one in which status is not hard to come by and it's freely given by other people. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Brett and I'm from West London. Um, in regards to conspiracy theories, we've obviously seen the um, capital riots in the US, um, a kind of escalation where people have done things due to conspiracy theories that I haven't seen before in my lifetime. So my question to you is, could that kind of behaviour um, happen elsewhere, for example, in the UK? And if not, what, what is the difference between these two societies that, that makes it possible uh, in one only? When I interviewed um, Richard Nisbet, who is one of the great gods of this idea of in, you know, Western individualism, the, the study of that, he said, basically, you know, the, 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 we get more and more individualistic as you go across kind of Western Europe. You know, UK is really individualistic and then America is really individualistic. And then he said it gets more and more individualistic until you fall into the Pacific Ocean is the way, way he puts it. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that's why sometimes in Europe we look at slightly asconce at America. Like, they're kind of crazy. And often their craziness, what, what we're seeing as craziness is, is they're really individualistic. Um, and, and I think that's certainly true in, in the US and that, and that, and that creates um, some of the kind of more wilder behaviors. But of course, you know, equally it, it is tribal, you know, it is, it is about, you know, like all of that stuff is, uh, that, that conspiratorial thinking, the QAnon people, you know, that's a tribe, that's a status game. Um, and, and this stuff is universal. You know, we, you know, we, we all kind of think like that to, 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 a, to a certain degree. So there, there, there's certainly no reason at all why we couldn't at some point, you know, things <laughs> carry on getting worse, um, see stuff like that happening in the UK. He says gleefully. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've absolutely loved talking to you today. I loved reading The Social Instinct, and it's been such an honour to kind of finally meet you and get to kind of grill you um, um, uh, on the stuff that I found most fascinating in that book. And I guess, you know, one of the takeaways I've got from our conversation today is that we really do have a genius for cooperation as a, as, as, the, as a human animal. And if we can, you know, if we, if we can kind of harness that even more, then there's no reason why um, the future shouldn't be bright for our species. Yeah, likewise, I, you know, massively enjoyed reading The Status Game and it's been great to chat about that in detail today and to think about the ways that this concern for all those three kinds of status that you talk about in the book just permeate every aspect of our lives. In the beginning of the pandemic, People scratch their heads and be like, why isn't Africa being wiped out? Like, why are tens of thousands of people dying in Western Europe with the most sophisticated public health care systems? I just have always found borders to be completely violent things. Nobody leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. People don't just flee unless there's something really difficult. When I see cultures really driven apart, rent asunder by these arguments about slavery, imperialism, colonialism, I'm like, there is an easier way. Thank you.